another episode of Beating Alpha. This is it, episode 84. I uh, have uh, all these cool guests, as you know, like this guest is in particular is very cool, very young, as, as he mentioned before, 33 years old only, but accomplished so many, so many great, great things uh, when it comes to real estate, building a real estate business. So just a quick introduction, Josh uh, Eidington, Eidington, sorry. Uh, he's a co-founder of DXC Properties, uh, where he brings significant acquisition and asset management experience. Uh, DXC Properties is a value-oriented boutique real estate investment firm providing commercial acquisition and asset management services for uh, clients. Currently with $60 million worth of acquisitions, the firm takes uh, a cautious approach to growth. Uh, that's a good topic to talk about. Working with their clients to acquire no more than two, three new deals each year. So uh, it seems like it's going to be a very interesting interview. So uh, thanks for joining me today, Josh. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. That's no problem. No problem. As I mentioned before, that's the way to go. I mean, to connect with people just like yourself and talk some business, talk real estate, and just to provide value to the people at the same time. So listen, kind of the first question, I think everybody would like to get to know Josh, as you mentioned, again, your surname, Aiden Gone, is, is a kind of, you know, you, you're coming from somewhere, but like <laughs> your personal journey in real estate industry, uh, can you talk about that? You know, how did you discover it and how did that journey look like for you? Sure. I'll, I'll give you the abridged version. Um, I, I start, I think I was always attracted to it. I, I, I read a lot of books that I think a lot of people and a lot of your listeners probably read like Rich Dad Poor Dad, ABCs of Real Estate Investing. And I was doing that while in college and it just made very fundamental sense to get involved in multifamily. It, it felt like relatively low risk and potentially high returns and reward from it. Uh, I, I left college without a real estate degree. Um, I went into the software field. I was a project manager there for a few years, um, but I, I had the real estate bug and I was looking at, uh, I'm, in the, I'm in the New York metro area. I live on Long Island, um, which is a pretty high barrier to entry market. Um, I was looking at some local two family deals or three or four family deals, but um, I did a bunch of networking, sort of like you alluded to, was connected to a property manager in, in the Midwest um, in Cincinnati. And he helped me find my first deal, a 20 unit distressed short sale back in 2011 now, it's been almost nine years. Um, and and that was my first project. And I was maybe young enough and dumb enough to, uh, pull the trigger and, and jump in. Um, so I, I did that while working full time, um, worked with that property manager. They, they helped manage the day to day and renovations. Um, and once I had that taste and I was seeing some success, I knew I had to get into real estate. Um, after a few years, I, I left that software company, almost cut my salary in half to work as um, a real estate analyst then made my way up as an acquisitions guy and uh, was leading an acquisitions team at one point, um, predominantly focused on value add multifamily in the Southeast, where we were looking at like you know, 15 to $30 million deals where there was some sort of traditional value add from two, th and that was for about four years. Um, then after that, I, I jumped and it was before I was, um, before I had any kids and, and was just sort of, I felt like it was now or never before I had a little less burden on my, on my shoulders to take that leap and, and start a DXC. And, and then um, after a little while with DXC, I brought in my partner, pulled him out of the corporate world. And, and um, here we are as a fast forward version of the story. Here you go. Here you go. Pulled your partner out of the, of the uh, corporate America. That's a great friend to have, you know? <laughs> people are pulling people out from nine to five into, you know, passive income world when it's like real estate investment. That is awesome. Well, you know, it, it's, uh, it's interesting. You could probably tell I'm, I'm maybe a little entrepreneurial and um, he comes from a very institutional corporate background where he worked for large uh, pension funds, development companies. Mm -hmm. And um, the thought process is we bring two very different um, skill sets and, and merge it together for DXA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And exactly. That's the key to having a right partnership where you can basically, uh, you know, 
like kind of sleep on you know your own expertise which is basically leveraging his expertise being you know this corporate guy and you know so i'm just looking at donato uh your partner setani uh, donato yes. so he uh he two billion dollars uh, redevelopment project in manhattan west uh, village neighborhood uh, so I'm just I'm just reading through again. You can guys uh, and girls uh, go to dxcproperties.com to kind of read through uh, their own personal bios, you know, investments, blogs. I mean, you have uh, some content available here on a, on a page. So make sure to go uh, and check that out. But talking, I've been uh, again coming back to the you you know and your journey into real estate investment world. You mentioned that you started this while having a full time job. So can you talk about that from your own perspective and your own experience? Because I think there is some people who are watching and still having the full-time job, but they want to pursue this, uh, you know, this real estate investing as a, you know, as a full-time thing. So how did you manage to do both at the same time? Well, it, it definitely helped that I, I did not have a, a family at the time. Uh, I'll say that I, I definitely had more time. Um, you know, I think that if your goal or, or path that, that you're trying to pursue is to ultimately replace your current income and be able to take the leap to real estate, you, you must be willing to put in the time. Um, so that may mean, you know, an extra two, three, four hours plus a day um, to be able to just keep chipping away at that goal. It's, it's, it's not easy. Um, I, I was perhaps fortunate that I was in a role where I did have some work at home time so I could take um, calls and be able to balance my job with beginning to build a real estate business. But, you know, as you're starting, especially without a track record, you have to work that much harder to get your foot in, in the door with every conversation that you have, whether it be an investor, a broker, a, an owner, a lender, um, the work is, is that much more time consuming. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely, there is a learning curve to to you know becoming a sophisticated real estate investor, right? And it takes a little bit of time. But what you said, if if you just surround yourself uh, with the people, just like Josh, you know himself, like Adam is a friend on on Instagram. That's what we started this conversation. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. in times like these, you can get access and you know to the people that used to be super busy. Now maybe they're less busy because they're working from home. And again, you can get an access to those people due to social media. So make sure to use these and, you know, tools and kind of start to surround yourself with the right people. That, that's a, you know, great no, way to- I think it, it's a great point. And I, I think a lot of people get nervous about, you know, reaching out to someone to ask for, for advice or, or, or just to have a conversation or to try to provide some value, you know, sort of how we connected. Um, you know, you just weren't afraid to reach out and say, Hey, would love to connect, chat, learn more about you, and and so on. And it's it's such a great way. And and I mean, I'll I'll if I miss, I, I make a point to try to answer every single email, whatever it may be, to provide some positive reinforcement or advice, whatever it may be. I, I love sort of seeing people find their way out of the rat race and and be able to build their business and do it on their own and add my two cents along the way. Yeah, yeah, definitely love it. So talking about the value add oriented boutique real estate investment firm, that's a long name, but basically what you do, you just buy kind of discounted or value add properties in uh, all the across US. So can you talk about your investment, your investing strategies? What, uh, maybe let's start of what states are you looking, uh, looking uh, in to acquire these deals? Yes, it's actually very targeted now. When we started, it was a little bit broader where we were maybe chasing the opportunity or where we knew had a contact there already but right now we're really only looking in three states north carolina south carolina and georgia um that's driven you know in part by demographics and the flight to the southeast um and then secondly just by our team we have a management team down there that we love lo we love the idea of building scale in those states um and I don't think you'll see us come out with any deals not in those three states for the foreseeable future. And are you planning to move to, other, to the other states at the same time as well in the future? No, just those three, just right? Just those three. Okay, yes. okay. But would you agree that there is good deals in some other states also at the same time? Every state, everywhere, anytime. Um, 
Got it. So why are you why are you so strict? Because I know there's a lot of real estate, you know, investors, syndicators, they kind of moving everything, you know, southeast, southwest, and you know, everything south. But I mean, there is more than three states. So how like why do you have you been so like specific about these states, like nothing else? Yeah, you, I'd say it's a few few reasons. Um, one, every city is very different. To really know a city, you know, to know it neighborhood by neighborhood. It takes time. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're focused in across those three states, only about six or seven different cities. Um, so we're not talking about, you know, a huge, you know, we're not talking about multiple states, multiple cities where you're all start, day one. Um, so we're really just taking the time to know it, to understand different points of growth, what's driving each individual city, and really become an expert on those specific cities, spending the time to know both the more regional and larger brokers that are in that space to the small guy that's a one-off broker and just being in front of him at all possible times. We'd rather be an expert in what we know for those few states than try to compete all over the country, especially when you know we're a smaller group, we're only gonna do a few deals a year. We'd rather do the best deals we could possibly do that are gonna complement one another regionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, and at the same time, your property management uh just works in these three uh, three uh, three states also or they work in some other states at, at the same time too they'll they'll work in others um so we have property managers that i, I mean one of the larger one that we use manages forty thousand plus units across six or seven states mm -hmm. here you go okay so who knows who knows maybe maybe at some time you know i'm not trying to convince you <laughs> you know to go and invest but it makes a lot you know, of sense yeah. You know what it is? I think that in a different environment, we'd possibly be willing to uh, yeah. spread more. And we've owned like in Florida in the past, we've owned in Ohio in the past. Um, but now it's just, it's that much more competitive. I think there's that much um, more sensitivity to every deal that you do that you just really want to understand it. And, yeah. you know, when, when distress part starts presenting itself again, Maybe we'll stretch out a little more, but um, probably not in the immediate future, at least. Got it. So now it's a little bit of a waiting game, kind of waiting and, and seeing, uh, you know, what's going to happen in the future. So again, when it comes to the underwriting and acquisitions, can you talk about what properties are you looking for? Because again, I'm, lo I'm looking at some of the properties and the recent one that you purchased was the, uh, I see the 104 units that's back, mm -hmm. back in April, right? That's the latest mm -hmm. one. Okay, yes. so that's Augusta GA. Uh, it's called Down Downtowner. So you, you should go and check it out. It looks like it seems like it's a it's a it's not a student's uh, it's not a student's place, no. Oh, it's a no. It's not. It's interesting that you say that. It was actually when it was built in the mid '80s. It was purpose built for students. So all the yeah. units are two bedroom, two bath with like roommate share type layouts. Um, Somewhere along the way that converted over to just more conventional rental. Um, and then over time with that property, it was one that was, it, it was owned by an out-of-state owner that owns a lot of mobile home parks and was really running it basically like a mobile home park, not reinvesting a dollar into it, had a terrible reputation in the marketplace. Um, but we really love its location. It's walking distance to the downtown area, walking distance to hospital major employers to um a college down there so um we i mean we only closed in april but um we're, we're spending probably spending one and a half million dollars across the 104 units um to really change the property inside and out um likely retenant much of the tenant base and and create some value yeah, because you mentioned, again, uh, when it comes to underwriting, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, I, I caught the word you said, uh, you buy distressed properties. So is, is that what you like leaning or, or leaning towards to most of the time when you're looking for the deals, kind of those distressed uh, properties, or it's more kind of, you know, small value adds? Um, if, if I could choose, if I could do whatever I wanted to at any point in time, I would love to buy the you know, distressed or heavy value add, you know, or even call it redevelopment type multifamily property. Um, it, it's a great complement to what I do and what my partner has done on the construction side. We're, we're really just 
I think we have the backgrounds to execute those very well. Uh, with that said, there's been very little distress for you know halfway decently located multifamily over the last, I don't know, call it five years or so, um, even five plus years. So much of what we've been doing, I would call it more of a, a moderate value add type story. We're looking for a story, something that has some, maybe some hair to it or some real opportunity. The Augusta deal was really a tenant-based transition that's going to you know, bring about some gray hairs and not be the easiest project, but there, there's the hair for it. Um, other deals, we'll, we'll look at loan assumption deals. We'll look at deals where owners might be coming to the end of just their, their debt and they have some level of motivation versus a, a refi. Um, we're just, you know, ideally we're buying the long-term owner story that has not invested into the property in the last 20 years. And we're able to be the ones that are able to do that and uh, capture that low lying fruit. Got it. So, so like when you're looking for deals, like how big has to be like, what, what is the minimum uh, number of units that you're looking for when, when you're looking to purchase a deal? So we've done smaller deals historically. Um, like e even as early as last year, we did a um, 30 unit property, right? But it's right in the heart of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, it was like 135 a door or so. Um, so I, I mean, excellent location. We are literally walking to like where the Carolina Panthers play and um, where Bank of America Tower is. So it, it really a cool deal. Um, a good story where they were not investing in the property. We've moved rents like $300 on that, that project. Wow. Um, with that said, it's not our preferred space. Um, we really don't want to do deals less than 70 or 80 units because you, you, you get so much more efficiency in, in management when you hit that unit count and you could have two full-time employees. Um, we, we, I'll say 70, 80, we really want to be north of 100. Um, but we very much play in that, call it less than most efficient space. So everyone will say 200, 250, 300 units is where you get your ideal efficiency. Um, with, you know, there's so much more competition there. We feel that you could really find some outsized returns by staying below that level of competition. So the Augusta deal is a good example. Right now, we actually have a recently accepted offer on a deal in Atlanta, 106 units. That's a similar type of profile and example. Got it, got it. So talking about the construction deals, like the what I'm looking at is townhouses on Hudson. Uh, you mm -hmm. saw that 2015. Uh, and again, I'm looking at the return uh, on investment in 18 months, though so that was the 40% return. So talking about the construction deals, do you have any projects in the pipeline for the construction deals, uh, you know, for, for your own business? And like when it comes to deals itself, what would you prefer? Is it the construction when it comes to retur return on investment? Is it construction or, or multifamily? Uh, well, New development's always going to have, uh, on, on paper, higher returns. There's a, certainly a risk element with new construction, new development. Um, we're not looking at any new development right now. Uh, it's just, we, I don't, and we haven't been in the last few years. That, um, that townhouse is on Hudson. That was a deal near, uh, actually, where my partner lives. And um, it was a one-off project where we were able to be pretty successful, but now is, we're just not comfortable um, stepping into new development now. I think there's a lot of factors. Um, and, and I think when you talk development, you just have to, you have to be there that much more frequently. Um, you know, it's really difficult candidly to run a new development project and not be there, you know, week to week, day to day. So that's why that, townhouses on Hudson, literally a 15 minute drive for us to have our eyes on it and be managing and overseeing that project. Multifamily, it's a little more efficient, a little less that perhaps that could go wrong day to day. Um, so, you know, it's been our focus. Um, we, we think that us and our investors just have much more of an appetite for existing multifamily right now. It's just safe relative to the stock market and 
new construction, I mean, we're seeing it even in renovations. To get appliances, it, it's, it used to be a phone call and you could get it in four days. Um, now there's been such a, a backlog that you could be waiting four or five weeks um, to get a refrigerator. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think it's everybody who kind of suffers during these times. It's a little bit crazy, but hey, listen, everybody knows what's going on. So I think I think they're okay with waiting for, for you know, for those four, four or five weeks or more. So listen, so talking again, talking uh, construction, multifamily, it seems like, again, you prefer multifamily over construction. I mean, during these times right now, it makes sense. Uh, so what about multifamily and retail space? Because I've seen you have a couple a couple of deals uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to retail space and I, I'm sure it's it cash flows, but like, do you have those deals currently? And uh, what do you think about, you know, retail in general, you know, from now and like going in the future a couple of years? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't know that there's, <laughs> there's certainly not a one word answer for it. Uh, with the two retail deals we own were both situational, um, both of us actually, in both cases, very local to us, um, and both of them are neighborhood shopping type plays that, you know, it's, we're renting to, in one case, a, a Dunkin' Donuts, a CVS, a local pizzeria, um, you know, the types of things that presumably are not going to go anywhere. Um, because you're, you're still, even during a pandemic, you still need to get those things. They were all essential businesses and we're never shutting down. Um, so we've been very fortunate on the retail side. I, um, I mean, we've, I don't think right now we have any delinquent tenants um, across all of our retail. Um, whereas I think countrywide, I think I read that only 60% of retail tenants um, are current. Um, so it's a scary time to be in retail. We're not actively looking for retail, even distress opportunities. We just think that much of that environment is going to see a pricing reset to a degree. Um, you know, I think people when they can and to whatever extent they can are always gonna wanna go to restaurants, um, but it, it's, gonna take, it's going to take some time. Um, we don't own any retail outside of the New York Metro. I think that it's likely a different story in other states, but you know, I, I think urban retail is, is going to, it's gonna feel a lot of pain. Um, and I think it's gonna take some time to, to catch up. So um, we've been fortunate. I, I like our retail deals a lot because I don't think they're going anywhere. And in, in both of their cases, there's a, a lot of growth going on around them. So I think they'll stay attractive, but, um, you know, it's, it's an area that I, I, I would have a lot of pause around um, getting involved in if you're not a seasoned retail guy or gal. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to, you know, diversifying, what do you think will be kind of your approach moving forward? Because uh, again, you have a little bit still of, you know, retail, um, you have multifamily and again, construction, which is you, you're not planning to do that. So are you planning to do only like 100% of multifamily just moving in the future? At least for the foreseeable future, yes. Um, okay. you know, I, for us, I think we'd rather be really good at, at what we do and, and be able to fill that, check that box for our investors and let them go elsewhere if, if they need, you know, if they want office exposure or they, you know, they want exposure to mobile home parks or different asset classes. We, we'd really like to just focus in on what we know and, and, and do that. Uh, so you'll likely only see multifamily deals from us for uh, at least the next few years ahead. Got it. So can you talk about your uh, multifamily deals and the way people can invest? Because again, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're using the multifamily family syndication um, approach to, to where you raise capital from those uh, limited partners, right? Exactly. That's okay. We've, um, you know, one thing I think we've done very well and it's taken time and been gradual for those of you that are starting, is really building our direct investor base. Just, it, it's mostly been friends, family, colleagues, and that's all been a small circle that's continued to grow and grow and grow. Um, but we do work with many passive investors um, in, in a pretty traditional LP style to invest in each of our projects on a one-off basis. Um, I would definitely, if you'd like to speak with us either just for, just to connect, like I said earlier, 
um, or to discuss being involved in a deal, I, I'd love to have that opportunity. Um, dxcproperties.com slash scheduler. You could directly schedule time on my calendar um, or Donato's for that matter. And, and we'd love to connect. We actually do, like I said, have a, a live active deal um, as of literally last week where we're just finishing putting together offering materials. So happy to share that to any accredited investors out there that'd be interested in discussing. Got it. So what will be kind of those requirements by the SEC regulations that people can can uh, come and invest with you? Can, can you talk about like the minimum West investment and like, do they need to set up an LLC? You know, do you, do they pay you cash check? Like what, what, what does that approach like for these people? We only take cash. No, I'm just kidding. That's <laughs> Uh, sorry, that's not a not a good joke. But I uh, so obviously we follow all SEC requirements. I, I mentioned accredited investors. So at this point, we are only working with accredited investors. Um, there's a few ways that you can uh, be classified an accredited investor. It could be net worth of a million dollars, excluding the value of your house, or if you've made over, I believe it's two hundred thousand dollars in the last year, in a reasonable likelihood to make $200,000 next year. Um, or if you're jointly with your husband or wife, I think that number is $300,000. Um, so that, that would check those, vol those boxes of accreditation. I actually know the SEC did broaden the language um, recently for uh, being classified as an accredited investor. I think it had more of a knowledge-driven accreditation, but I, I, I'm not it, it was recent, so I'm not positive um, sort of how that played out. But for us, we a minimum investment for us is $50,000. We will typically structure our deal so that um, there'll be an investment return structure at $50,000, and then at $300,000 is slightly better splits, really to just incentivize a greater investment. Got it. So talking about your current, uh, you know, AUM, like how many units do you have currently under management? Uh, it's about it's five or 600. 600. Got it. So again, 2020 is still not over. And uh, like when you mentioned before, you just look to close two, three deals a year. So you closed one this year, which was the latest in, in August. That, that was the latest this year, right? The in April. One. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So do you have anything in the pipeline currently that you're looking at that's worth closing this year also? Yes. We're going to close on this Atlanta deal. Um, it, the, it may it may push into the beginning of January, admittedly, but I'm going to try for December. Um, 106 units, excellent location, Atlanta. It's, it's a deal that's um, less of a value add than the Augusta project, um, much driven by the tenant base, that it's a tenant base that's already there and, and, and pretty good. Uh, so it's just really an opportunity to more gradually upgrade units, but, but we really like the deal. We think it's a great basis. There's some um, additional upside from a cell tower, um, also some opportun opportunity to add a supplemental loan next year. So um, we think it's just a great deal, great, just call it fundamental real estate in a good location that should continue to grow. Good, good. So yeah, you mentioned that the deal before when we spoke about, so do you think it's gonna be only two deals this year or are you planning to, to acquire a third one also? Probably so, two. We, two. We lost a lot of months from, um, yeah. from where things really froze after April all the way through Got it. July, things started opening up again in terms of just deals. Yeah. Um, so, so talking about you this so, year, <laughs> so talking about moving forward, uh, forward, you know, with the next year, and of course, maybe the next year is going to be a little bit more positive. But hey, who knows? The business is business. You're still going to be open for it. You're still going to go and and look for the deal. So, like from your own or uh, you know personal uh, business standpoint, because I'm sure I'm sure you said you sat down with your business partner and talked about kind of what we're going to do next year. So maybe you can share a few kind of you know insights what you guys are planning to accomplish for for the upcoming year. Yeah, so I guess well, I'm going to partially answer your question and partially not. Uh, so one, I think something just to keep in mind amongst COVID and everything, and I'm sure you've asked other interviewees, like how, how they're underwriting for COVID as you look to the year ahead. Um, I mean, we're, we're just flatlining all market rent growth. So zero market rent growth in 2021. Um, maybe that'll outperform, maybe it won't. 
but that, that's really the number one measure that we're taking. And then secondly, we are increasing bad debt for that first year. Um, you know, the one time increase to bad debt really rarely impacts your overall returns. Um, but flatlining market rent growth in that first year is really meaningful. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see, but I, I think those are really the key things that we're doing cautious because we do believe in the multifamily space longer term and once we get through um, this and a vaccine's out there and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talking about rents, can you talk about, you know, your property management, which by the way you said, you know, it's like they do manage 40, you said 40,000 units, something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So can you talk, because uh, I'm sure they're very experienced, you know, property management companies. So can you talk about how do you handle these tenant issues again during the COVID times when it comes to the rent payments at the moment? It has all been about communications. Um, really, really being in front of residents that much more, even if not in person, but making sure that they're receiving letters on a weekly basis and, and they're, they're understanding that, hey, just because evictions may be delayed or there's moratorium, whatever, whatever it may be in, in that area, your rent is still accruing and it's still owed, um, but yet we're here to, we want, you know, you're a tenant of ours, a partner of ours, and we want to work with you and, and help you out of what's a difficult situation. So we and our property managers have been active in terms of offering payment plans, um, you know, offering different types of relief to help people sort of get over this hurdle. Um, and then in the same breath, on the other hand, for the people that just are refusing to leave or move, um, you know, we're starting that, making sure we're, we're ahead of it as much as possible in, in the eviction process. Like right now, you're still able to evict. It's, it's a, there's a burden on, on the tenant or the resident to, to show a hardship ultimately. Um, but, you know, it's a time unlike any other right now. Um, the National Apartment Association suing the CDC because of this eviction moratorium. So, I mean, it's probably never going to play out in a timely fashion where the lawsuits can be meaningless, but, um, you know, it really all starts with communication. Um, I, and I think nurturing that tenant base and doing little things to continue to be responsive, obviously everything cleanly related is a necessity. Um, but knowing that it's a, it's a community and these are people's lives and livelihoods. So I, I think trying to work with people first and foremost is the, is the first step. Got it. Yeah. I love it. Good, good approach. So listen, talking about, uh, again, marketing approach, because we spoke before uh, the interview for a few minutes and, you know, I kind of mentioned that, you know, there's possible to, again, to increase the deal flow and, you know, uh, for people to invest more in your, you know, in your deals with the, by the using social media in the right way. So again, from, you know, the way it sounds, what you said that you don't have a problem with, you know, capital available to you, but maybe, you know, deal flow, uh, those great deals coming towards your way uh, could be, you know, maybe improved. So like, what do you guys currently are looking, uh, you know, when it comes to social media approaches, do you, what, like, do you have a strategy? Like what platforms do you use and what type of advice would you give for people who have a real estate business also? So is this from a, from a deal perspective, a deal sourcing perspective? Yeah, deal sourcing or raising capital, if, if that's you think, if that's an issue for you as well. Or... Yeah, I, I mean, on the capital raising side, you do have to really be careful. Um, just SEC restrictions, there, it, there, there is some gray um, there, but, and I'm, I'm not an attorney, so take, take that for what it's worth. You definitely do need to be careful with how you are raising money on, on social media. Um, I, I shouldn't be, frankly, uh, unless you're following right paths or possibly working with, um, I, I would suggest working with a third party that's going to authenticate any investor and, and so on. Um, you know, on the deal sourcing side, we admittedly don't do much through social media. I think it's perhaps to our own fault because I do think there's some real opportunity there um, to just connect with owners directly. Um, I, I think you're probably doing it already. We know that there, we know of people that have been pretty successful just connecting with owners, the, albeit, you know, in the same group that might be talking about just real estate strategies and that person's maybe willing to sell their deal to someone within that network. 
um, I think that's a reasonable path. Um, we, we just don't do it. I think from what we've seen, and we've tried like direct mail and direct calls, cold calls and things like that, we've had less and less success as our deal size has been getting larger. Um, with larger deal sizes, we've really become reliant on property managers, brokers, and the handful of direct owner relationships that we have. Um, you know, the, the wholesaling or bird dogging, it, it becomes that much less reliable as, as the size gets bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense, definitely. At the same time, uh, you know, there is so many different uh, social media channels that, again, are open for investors, as you said, like in the beginning stages. Uh, and that's why I'll ask the, you that question, because there's people who, who are having zero assets under management currently. So like, how are you going to source those deals as you like, I'm sure you have a lot of deals coming through your pipeline, but you're just picking like two or three, like you got two this year. Again, because again, of a few months that were kind of, you know, stopped and the, the whole COVID thing, but I'm sure, and I mean, it works if you just leverage across multiple platforms, even though you're growing, because like we know, I personally know people, and I'm sure some of the people who are watching know players in the business who have, you know, billion dollars on the management and they still using the social media approach. So that means there is, there is a reason for that, why they use that approach still. Like, but I do, I do understand your perspective, but I'm, I'm happy that you clarified that, you know, in the beginning stages, it's a great way to approach and, you know, to, to raise capital or again, you have to be careful and make sure you follow the SEC regulations for that. So talking about the social media, so uh, like, what will be the best places for people to get and reach you out? And I would definitely love for you guys and girls who are watching to reach out to, you know, Josh and ask him a few questions about passive active investing, so anything, anything, because this is the show and opportunity for you to go and, and reach him out. And again, uh, real estate investing multifamily in particular is a great way to be uh, in because what's going on currently in the jobs market, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty, as you know yourself, Josh, people are probably, uh, you're coming across people or your particular maybe investors who are looking for ways to preserve and grow wealth uh, with different asset classes. And again, real estate multifamily being one of them, I think it's a great place to be in. And that's why I want you to go and contact Josh. So sorry for talking long, what will be those social media platforms for them to contact you? So we, uh, you can use Facebook. We have a Facebook page, DXC Properties. You can go to our website and reach out to us directly. Um, you can also follow us on LinkedIn or Instagram, um, all DXC Properties. You'll, you'll find us there. There you go. And all those links, of course, is always going to be down below for you. Easy to click and go and follow. So make sure that you do that. Go and follow Josh, get in contact with him, send him a few messages, ask him a few questions. As, as Josh said, you know, don't be afraid uh, to do those things. Uh, because if you want to move the needle a little bit, uh, you know, further, you have to, you have to go and follow through with, with at least that in the first place. So Josh, I really appreciate the time today. It's been a good fun to get to know you a little bit more again. 33 years old and accomplished so many things so far. So I wish you guys uh, that you, you know, you get more deals under your belt up in upcoming year. I hope, you know, the, the, the year is going to be grateful for you, you know, and you're going to accomplish more stuff in the upcoming year, which I'm sure you will. So uh, best of luck with that. And for the people who are watching, you know, just one thing that I wanted to ask you, if you just pass it along this message, if you just share it with a friend that might be interesting into real estate investing, passive, active, whatever that might be, if you just pass it along, share with them, I will appreciate that. And again, Josh, thank you for the time. Uh, and guys, uh, thanks for watching. And as always, I'm going to see you in the next episode. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.